Shall we ask the Lord's guidance so that we may more clearly understand what is being presented before us? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this day of rest. We thank you for this day that we may come together, setting aside the cares of the world, setting aside the things that soon will be of no importance so that we may learn from you the things that are of eternal importance. I thank you for each one that are involved in this study today. We ask, Father, for your blessing and for your guidance. May your spirit be with us. May your angels attend us. For we need to learn more of your character. We need to learn more of what it truly means to worship you in spirit and in truth. For this, Father, we seek. For this, we ask and we pray. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Now, last Sunday morning, we covered this paragraph. We're going to touch back through it and cover a couple of others. And then we're going to go into Zephaniah chapter two. The Lord claims the service of all who believe the truth for this time. Whose service is he claiming? As Mrs. White has written here. Well, our service, because if we believe the truth for this time, then we're supposed to be in service of the Lord. Does that mean that those that believe present truth are the ones from whom he is claiming their service? Mm -hmm. They are to be laborers together with Christ in proclaiming the message of mercy to the world. How do we see this message of mercy? Is it not present truth? Is it not the message of Revelation 14 and the message of Revelation 18? Is it not the gospel by which man can be made righteous by faith? God is committed to each talents to be used for his name's glory. <clears throat> it does not mean that each have to have exactly the same talent. There are talents that each of us have that complement others. If we are choosing to set aside the talents of one, then, then the entire work is diminished. The vineyard is the world. The soil to be cultivated is found in every city, in every village, in the highways and the byways, in places near and afar off. Seed is to be sown in the good works that will benefit those who have not had the light of present truth. The kind of ministry brought to view in the 58th chapter of Isaiah is to be faithfully done. Those who are arrayed in Christ's righteousness, the beautiful garments of truth, and those whose lives are being sanctified by the truth will go forth to labor for all classes with, evil, with equal solicitude. They will not be bound about by bands of selfishness, 
but will regard all the world as the field. What does this say to us each today? Well, one of the things, uh, the 58th chapter of Isaiah, as we know, that's the one cry loud, spare not, lift up your voice as a trumpet, show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins, goes into about what the true fast is compared to the fast that the Jews were doing. They're fasting for strife and debate. Right. Uh, so, uh, and then we're going to have, they that the shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations. They shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. When um, thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from my whole holy day, calling the Sabbath a delight, glory of the Lord, honorable, etc. Right? So you got these this passage, the 58th chapter, and it is dealing with ultimately those that are going to be proclaiming the Sabbath. Right? Keeping the true Sabbath and and restoring the old paths. So it, it's a pretty important chapter in the book of Isaiah. And so these are those that have Christ's righteousness that are going to be doing this because the Sabbath is a sign that the Lord sanctifies us. So it is about the fast is is to do the work that God has given us to do. In this situation, you cannot be sanctified unless you have first come to be justified. Mm -hmm. Just as we have stated, and many times Mrs. White has presented, that you cannot have a first angel's Message. You cannot have a second angel's message without having a first angel's message. And mm -hmm. therefore, you cannot have a third without having a first and a second. Mm -hmm. You cannot become sanctified without becoming justified. They are each steps in the process. Let your light so shine before men, the Savior declared, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There is to be no limit to the places where the light should shine. It is to reach to the regions beyond. Tell it, urge upon all with earnest force to give their service for those who are in the darkness of error. To teach the word of God to unbelievers to unite our prayers for them, our duties that we owe to our Redeemer. There is a time when every church and every family should be exercised unto godliness. <clears throat> I feel sad as I see men and women and youth spending time and energy in self-gratification. Selfishness is occupying much time that the Lord would have devoted to religious activities. I have been shown that the money that is lavishly spent by many believers for unnecessary things should be given to the work of winning souls that are ready to perish. It is time that our people felt the need of being laborers together with God. Self-denial and self-sacrifice are highly appropriate for this time. We are laborers together with God, the Spirit through Paul declares. If unbelievers see in our works and lives, devotion and self-sacrifice in order to save souls ready to perish, they will be impressed with the reality of the truths we profess. The truth that sanctifies the receiver will make its impression upon them. There is a time when every soul needs to cling earnestly to God. Those whom the Lord is leading to do his last work in the earth are to stand as Micah and Zephaniah and Zechariah stood in their day to call to repentance and good works. 
the writings of these prophets contain warnings and instruction applicable to this time and should receive our careful study. They should teach us to shun every phase of evil that made such warnings essential to the people of the past. Let every soul arouse and make diligent examination of self that everything that would separate the people of God from righteousness may be put away. <clears throat> So let me ask you this. Justification and sanctification. Are they not two steps on the path to righteousness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we I think Ellen White gives the example there like two oars. I mean, they go together. You can't have justification without the work of sanctification. You can't have sanctification without the work of justification. Um, one is our title to heaven. The other is our fitness for heaven. Um, this is, I mean, this is why, you know, in our studies of the lines, we're seeing clearly that these, these words are really tied to the three-step testing prophetic message of the everlasting gospel. Agreed. Oh, that our people would arouse and put away all weakness of the flesh and the spirit. It was for this that Christ wept and prayed. The heart of infinite love was stirred as he saw souls snared and selling themselves for worldly gain. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, he said, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine, eye, if thine eyes be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, <clears throat> or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. I have thought much of how little burden is carried by those who know the truth for those who know it not. Christ came to this world to call sinners, not the righteous, to repentance. Those who know the truths of the word of God are not to hide their light in obscurity, but as faithful missionaries are to give the warning message to unbelieving neighbors and friends. They are to work as Christ has given them example. All who have a knowledge of the testing truths for this time should ask themselves the question, am I giving the time and labor to the work of saving souls that Christ requires of his followers? I would say to all of our people, place yourselves in the light that you may reflect light and that souls may be led to see the great and soul-saving truths of the word of God. Every believer in Christ should be a laborer together with him in drawing souls from sin to, to righteousness. We are to keep in view the life that measures with the life of God. We are to watch for opportunities to bring the truths of the word before those 
who do not see and understand. Christ is not now with us in person, but through the agency of the Holy Spirit, he is presented to impart his power and grace and great salvation. There are several <clears throat> that are currently operating in this area that claim to be believers in the present truth, yet claim that there is no Holy Spirit. How can you have the agency of the Holy Spirit if there is no Holy Spirit? You talking about other Adventists or? Yes, I am. Wow. Well, I mean, wouldn't they say that just that the Holy Spirit's not a person? Right. They do. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, they don't say that there is no Holy Spirit, just that the Holy Spirit is either the Spirit of Christ or it's some kind of uh influence or something like that usually people just say it's the spirit of christ so it's not it's it's not a separate agent yet does not mrs white many times refer to the person of the holy spirit mm -hmm. yeah and the three persons of the godhead mm -hmm. correct they have so, so if they are setting aside that there is no person of the holy spirit Mm -hmm. they are also setting aside that which is of the Godhead. And for me, that's a very sad situation. Yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, there are different understandings and people. Um, I mean, I understand the problems that they have, but not everyone who... Um, sort of argues against the Trinity and takes a position regarding the Holy Spirit is necessarily in a dangerous situation. Um, I, I mean, I used to believe that for quite a long time. So Did the Holy Spirit uh, come down and uh, land on Jesus in the form of a dove. Yeah. So how couldn't there be a second? I mean, um, no physical attributes. Well, so that, I mean, that's, one is, this isn't something that we can understand. And Ellen White says that this is not an issue um, that, you know, that man can understand and, and we need to take the shoes off our feet. Um, I, I just don't think that we can define for others how their thinking works, because a lot of times it has to do with people's ability to understand abstractions. Um, but here in this case, um, uh, you know, we know that the Father is God. Jesus is has the same title of Jehovah as the Father has. We know he is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, but it is a person. And how to understand that, that's where people, I think, make the mistake, is we try to define something and in trying to define it, we sort of define it away. That is, we try to explain something that can't be explained. So the way that I deal with it is I just accept what Ellen White and the Bible say about the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't try to um, try to tell others how they have to think of it. Um, but if somebody is going to believe that, you know, there is no Holy Spirit that, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't work upon us. I don't know if I've ever run into any Adventists who don't believe that there is a Holy Spirit, but they're going to define it maybe as the Spirit of Christ. It's his presence, which is true. Um, it's quite clear a different spirit of prophecy quotes that the Holy Spirit is Christ divested of humanity. And... Uh, so in some ways, you know, that can be true. But when they try to make it not a person, then, uh, you know, uh, that would go against, I think, plain statements in the spirit of prophecy as well. But I, I don't think we should make this a test of salvation. 
because um, many people, yeah, but because many people just have a limit in their ability to understand some things. But when people make it a test of salvation that we have to accept that they're, you know, they're the spirit, the Holy Spirit is not a person, then that would also be an error. That would be the issue, not so much that somebody doesn't understand it, but that they're urging upon it, they're urging it upon others as necessary uh, to salvation that we have to understand it the way they do. And I wouldn't force them to understand it the way that I do. Anyway, that's just my, my view on it, dealing with this for a lot of years. And, and there are different views, even people that we call anti-Trinitarians, there's quite a few different, um, uh, different uh, positions that people have taken that are not necessarily the same. But I'm not sure who Dwight's talking about as far as, if they say there is no Holy Spirit, that there is no such agency, then that would go directly contrary to the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. And that's exactly what I'm referring to. So they just don't believe there's a Holy Spirit at all. They say that there is no such person as the Holy Spirit. There is no agency of the Holy Spirit, period. Yeah, so that would be a rejection of the spirit of prophecy. But some people may, in their trying to understand an issue, um, just have... A, a poor uh, explanation on how they understand it. But yeah, if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit can work through your life, um, that it speaks to you, um, then that would be, to me, uh, something that would hinder your walk with God. Okay. Now... Zephaniah chapter 2. As the translators had laid this out, the first three verses are an exhortation to repentance. The next, the judgment upon the, Philist on the Philistines of Moab and of Ammon, of Ethiopia and of Assyria. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Could we say this as gather yourselves together, O movement not desired? For is not the movement that of a nation? coming together to understand a message that is going to seem very strange to many in the world and extremely strange to many within the corporate church. <clears throat> before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger, come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. What is Zephaniah warning us about here? What is he telling us to do? Well, seek. Telling us to seek God and seek his qualities, meekness, righteousness. Uh, meekness is self-control and temperance. Is he also not telling us to seek by faith the righteousness of Christ? Amen. So is he, t is this, is Zephaniah, this prophet, telling us 
of our great need of righteousness through faith, not through our own work. For was not Christ meek? Yes, he was. Now, uh, one of the things about meekness, so we're Christians and we know that meekness is good, right? Right. Good to be meek. This is not the way that people thought in the time of Zephaniah or in the time of Christ. That is, meekness was seen as weakness. So the idea of seeking righteousness, we can see that's right doing, but the idea of seeking meekness is, is something that goes contrary to human nature. What was said about Moses? Well, he said he was the meekest man that ever lived. So if Moses was the meekest man that ever lived, mm -hmm. was he not to the children of Israel an earthly representation of Christ? Mm -hmm. But when he says that about himself, he's not saying it um, as something that that is good. That is what he's proclaiming is his weakness, his dependence upon God. Right? You know, it, 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 because we have this misunderstanding regarding the idea of what meekness is. Right? So... Some people would say, well, when Moses declares himself the meekest man that ever lived, he's obviously not being very meek, right? But did not Moses recognize his great need right. and that he day by day needed to have further reliance upon Christ? Right. So that's what meekness is. It's a recognition of our dependence upon God. Um, so, so it's it's about human weakness. That's what meekness is about. Really can't say that he was in our definition of meekness that 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 Moses was because I mean this is the guy that told him, hey go stone that dude hey do this hey do that that's not me. Right. So the idea, the word meekness has kind of changed its its connotations sure. on how we look at it. Because as Christians, we would just see meekness as something that, you know, that is desirable. Um, the idea of meekness here in this word, anava, means a condescension. Um, and it's kind of a human and subjective modesty, a divine or objective clemency gentleness, humility, meekness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to seek that. So that's a dependence upon God. Um, and, and only when we have that can we actually really seek righteousness because we can't be righteous in and of ourselves. Was Christ righteous? Mm -hmm. I would say so. Okay. We have also been addressing that Christ was meek. Mm -hmm. So, in this situation, how many people were there that Christ threw out of a synagogue? Say that again, please. How many people were there that Christ threw out from the synagogue? Well, if we're talking about the time that he went through with, uh, with the ropes turned into a whip uh, to get rid of the... Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking of the temple. Okay. When, when Christ went and he... Read, when he was handed the, the role of Isaiah and he read from this and he told the people this day this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears 
how many people did he then cast out from that synagogue? None. He actually walked out, didn't he? Yes. My point is when you have those that are deciding that they must cast out others, the character that is being represented is not that of Christ. I agree. Mm -hmm. Now, now the word in, in Numbers uh, 12, verse 3, where it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Um, that word meek, and it's related, of course, to the other word meekness, um, but it means poor, humble, afflicted, meek, poor or needy, poor and weak, poor, weak and afflicted, humble, lowly, meek. Which actually defines his character. Right. So in order to have righteousness, we have to recognize our condition as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, right? Right, right. exactly. Yeah. So, so this goes to what I was talking last night about Christ, is that he did not see himself as righteous. Because he was meek, because he recognized that in his flesh dwelt no good thing. His nature was the same nature you and I have. He was dependent upon God. Now, he made himself dependent upon his father by taking upon himself human nature, but he clothed divinity with humanity. He could have produced righteousness of his own, but instead he depended upon his father's righteousness. He saw himself as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And that's why he's our example. Right. Otherwise, he couldn't be our example. If he, right. knew, if he knew who he was by memory of heaven, if he had just been demonstrating his own innate righteousness, he wouldn't be our example. Because we couldn't, we couldn't do that. No. So we are told that we are to seek the Lord. But the admonition is given, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. Those that are not meek do not see their great need of what the Lord is able to do. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Judgment, righteousness, meekness. Justification sanctification, judgment. You, you know, um, just because I've presented this many times through the years. Mm -hmm. And in, in showing that Christ, what his meekness meant and what it meant that he kept righteousness by faith. Um, so probably to hundreds and hundreds of Adventists, I've done these presentations on the nature of Christ and um, very rarely are the listeners um, appreciative of the message. Let's put it that way. That is, there might be one person when I do a presentation who comes up and you can really see that it had an effect upon them. But to everyone else, this is not really a welcome message. No. And why do we think that? Why, why do you think that is? Why wouldn't people be happy to know that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and that Christ is going to provide his righteousness for them? And, and, it's, and it doesn't matter what position they are on the spectrum of uh, whether they believe in, uh, you know, conservative Adventism or liberal Adventism. 
actually some of the strongest reactions against it come from conservative Adventists. Um, I had a really strong reaction when I shared this with um, uh, the guy who started Hope International. Um, what was his name? Um, the old guy. People know his name. Anyway. Um, I just can't think of it. Anyway, he, he had a really strong reaction to it. I mean, he claimed I was teaching new theology, um, which made no sense. Um, I'll think of his name later. Jeff Rutt. What's that? Jeff Rutt. No, he's not the one who started Hope International. Um, I just can't think of it. I'm really bad at recovering names from my brain. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so so the question is, why are people so reactive to this idea that we are we are to be meek in a biblical sense? Doesn't but, it fly, doesn't it fly in the face of what man has developed over the centuries? I mean, the, the attitude that we have often seen expressed is that we need to be in control of our surroundings and of our world. When you're meek, you're admitting that you're not in control, that there is someone greater than you. Would that not be a point? Oh, and we need to remember the hymn. This is our father's voice. So Jeff Rutt was the founder of it. It wasn't. Um, uh, what's his name? I stuck a link in there. I see it. Thank you. Well, he wasn't definitely wasn't the one running it. That's so. possible, but you know they, they're they're claiming that he was the founder. Okay, so he but, well anyway, it was run by um, can't think of the guy's name. Maybe it's in the link there. That's not that's not the. That's not the organization. That's a different organization. Is it? It's Hope International, a Seventh Day Adventist, right? Is that a? This is that's a completely different organization. Um, you'd look up Our Firm Foundation magazine. I mean, I can I can find it here really quick if you want me to. Um, as I have, he's he's the editor of our firm foundation magazine. Well, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Um, and Ron Spear. Okay. Yeah, that's who I was thinking of. So yeah, and. Yeah, it was actually at Silver Hills. I was at Silver Hills, and he was there. And uh, was not too impressed with what I was sharing. But but the question is why? Because it, it well, was. Well, wants to know that they're taught, they're they're wretched, miserable, <laughs> those types of things. And when they're thinking that I'm so great now, I'm I'm a Seventh Day Adventist. I'm I'm walking with God, so I can't be any of those things. But he's somebody who was professing to teach Jones and Wagner's message of righteousness by faith. No and, and I was actually uh, presenting almost uh, word for word from A.T. Jones without telling people what I was sharing. So I was, I was using Jones... Um, Work, huh? <laughs> you know, 18, 1893 General Conference Bulletin Sermons. 
the 1895 General Conference Bulletin uh, sermons. So, so he didn't even recognize that I was quoting A.T. Jones, yet he professed to believe in A.T. Jones. If I had said, here's what A.T. Jones said and read it, he would have agreed. But because I didn't say who it was that said it, he and he just thought it was my own words, he then reacted to it negatively. So, so it taught me something at the time uh, regarding how people um, really don't understand what it is they're reading. They've taken a position um, and they profess to believe something, but they haven't really understood it. That's, uh, that's recognizing that, um, you know, in, in recognizing that, uh, you're recognizing that the things that are inside of our mind might be, you know, actually causing those uh, those other thoughts. And then when you hear the the words like that came from A.T. Jones, and he didn't recognize them, that's because he didn't have the connection. Like you said, if you would have told him that was from A.T. Jones, he'd have been okay with that. Right. He would have said, oh, A.T. Jones said it, it must be correct. And he would have. But. Most, most everybody, just when they read stuff, they, it's there still, but it's not there um, until you get re, you know, reminded of things. And then a lot of times, like I myself, I go to I continually go to the source. I said, what? Wait a second. Hold on. Let me see. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. But so there is something about it when when it's presented in its understanding of what the cross of Christ was, what it means that Christ was righteous by faith. Uh, we don't want to see Christ as weak, right? Even though we say he's meek, we, we, we use meek in some sort of sense of, uh, well, here's an example. This maybe isn't the best example, but it's the one I think of. Um, so let's say you have a sports celebrity and, you know, he, well, he had a fantastic game, right? Mm -hmm. And, and he's obviously the best player in the world, whatever sport it is, but he's going to say it wasn't, it's, it's my teammates, right? If it's a team sport, it's my oh, teammates no. that that's why I'm doing so well. Now we would say he's being meek, right? He's being humble. Being humble, yeah. But isn't it just sort of a put-on kind of humility? You know what I mean? It's, it's something that people do to, because it's expected of them. Yes. That is, it's, he's not really meek. He's just acting meek. Right. And that's the way I think people look at Christ. I mean, he's the son of God. He's powerful. So he's obviously not really weak or meek. It's just he acts meek. That is, he acts humble. So we need to act humble. That's all meekness is. But meekness is weakness in, in its very definition. It's meek means that I am unable, I am poor, I am weak, I am afflicted, I am a wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's what meekness is. And so Christ didn't just act meek, you know, uh, for the cameras, so to speak. He actually felt his weakness. We should feel ours too, which makes us reliant on God. And he in Proverbs it. it says that he has, yeah, he that has control over his own spirit is better than he that he that takes a city, right? We need to control with his help. The only way we can overcome our afflictions and our weaknesses is through him. So now I'm beginning to come to the point where I see Paul's point more and more. That he was strong in Christ. His weakness gave Christ a chance to glory. That it was only Christ operating through him that Paul could glory in. 
you know, I think I know that's why the Lord has been dealing with me housewives so much, letting these things happen, because I have to rely constantly on him. And I'm amazed at the healing and the spiritual progress when I do that. And the 144,000, um, they the reason that they can represent Christ is because they have no trust in their own humanity, in their own nature. Right? They trust fully to Christ. They cling to Christ because they see in themselves no good things. They are truly meek, not in the sense of acting meek, but in the sense that they recognize their weakness and their inability to produce righteousness on their own. Okay, I'm ready to answer your question now. So the question was, what was the posed question? Why do they, why do, they do that? Why yeah. do they, okay, um, understanding. They're using human understanding um, for the word meekness and not, not what the Bible uh, describes it as. Well, and yeah, the spirit of prophecy describes it as. Yeah, so so definitely they they don't understand what meekness is, and it's and and it is partly a definitional thing, but it's also an experience thing. Yeah, they have, experience. They've, really, really, they've never really experienced meekness. They've never had to give up everything for Christ. So many Adventists, when they if if they become Adventists. But for ones who are raised Adventists, they might never have this experience. I mean, they might never understand a dependency on Christ. I think a superficial weakness or something like that. Yeah. Well, they have to be converted. The first step is to recognize that we are sinners. Mm -hmm. And many of us don't recognize we are sinners. That is, we might know we do bad things, right? I mean, we're not, not stupid in that sense. But we don't really see ourselves as sinners. Because when we look at others, what do we say? I'm thankful I'm not like this other person is. You know, I go to church on the Sabbath. I eat properly. You know, I pay my tithe. All these different things that the Pharisees also did. But they don't go down to their house justified. It's the one who says, God be merciful to me, a sinner, who goes down to his house justified. And yet, as Seventh-day Adventists, the thing that I see the most is this type of boasting. I, I was in a Sabbath school class one time in Calgary, and um, it was quite a large Sabbath school class because it's a huge church. So there was more in that Sabbath school class uh, in that in that one room than we would ever have in Warburg. But so there'd be about 30 people and somebody was visiting and they were commenting about how wonderful it is that as a Seventh-day Adventist, I can go anywhere in the world and everything is the same. You know, I'm studying the same Sabbath school lesson and so forth. And and I made a comment. I didn't actually think that was a good thing. I agree. That's, that this is this is sort of a culture of Adventism that really creates what we would call a cult. That is um, where in this idea somehow that we are all special, that we are all of this class of Christians who know everything and and we're going to be saved. We're basically Pharisees in that sense. And and what we have in our Sabbath school lesson is a very superficial studying of the scriptures, but also a very superficial evaluation of ourselves and of our church. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We're going to be saved. We know that Saturday is the Sabbath. And, and the reason we don't like Ellen White is for the very simple reason she tries to unmask that delusion that we are under. Amen. So true. And and part of the problem is when people read the spirit of prophecy, 
who do read it, they often use it to attack others. So they read something in the spirit of prophecy and they use it against other people instead of using it against themselves. And so, so this message is not a popular message. The idea that I actually need Christ, even though it's the basic principle, first step in the gospel, it's not really a welcome message. Adventists don't want to receive conviction of their sins when they go to Sabbath school or church. I have noticed that um, it was, it's more of a justification uh, conference when you're in Sabbath school. Yeah. Anyway, Dwight, you want to go on with this uh, reading? Okay. <clears throat> trying to cover what we just talked about. So. It's covering it well. <laughs> Before you now is Manuscript 3, 1861. The entire manuscript had not been previously published. Only portions had been published. This is the testimony for the Mill Grove, New York Church. Let us see what Mrs. White had to say to them that is now applicable for ourselves today. I was shown the state of things at Mill Grove. I saw that a heavy cloud was hanging over the church there. Some are trying to overcome and show their faith by their works. Such have felt that they have suffered much on account of the reproach needlessly brought upon them by a class in Mill Grove, who had no desire and made no efforts for the truth to elevate them. Moreover, these slack, untidy, uncultivated ones were ever dwelling upon pride, watching the dress of the sisters, their bonnets and their articles of dress, if they saw marks of neatness and taste, their testimonies and burdens would be upon pride. They were not content to see any moving above the low level upon which they stood. How many times does Sister White tell us we must reach higher yet higher? But yet how many times are we still more satisfied with staying low rather than reaching high. Some embrace inner afraid of change. Repeat, please. Sorry. Historically, men are afraid of change or humans are afraid of change. Right. Yet, unless we are willing to change, will we ever seek justification and then sanctification and be prepared for the judgment that is to come? Some embraced the truth in Mill Grove years ago and have made no advancement. Some have embraced the truth in the present truth movement and have made no advancement. Mm -hmm. They have not felt the necessity of advancement and continual reform. Has there been a change in the meaning of continual in the English language since 1861? No. So if there are those that have not felt the necessity of advancement, of moving forward and continually seeking to be reformed, then we are among that class. Satan has used them as his agents to drag down and confuse. For years, Solomon Cottrell's family attended meetings 
professing to be God's people. They were a hindrance all the time. They were a living curse to God's cause. May this not be said upon us or about us. The spirit of Solomon's wife was always bitter against the gifts. Her own ways were right in her own eyes. She was joined to her idols. And although she professed to believe the truth, she made no effort to have it elevate her. Their children came up uncultivated with the same rebellious spirit, fighting the gifts of the church and, like their parents, opposing order, opposing advancement, opposing the system in the church. If they believed in the gifts which God had placed in the church, they knew that they must lay aside tea, coffee, and tobacco. They would not renounce all these things, therefore must fight the visions which cut off their idols. Where in scripture are we shown one that is joined to their idols? And what is the admonition that is then given? I think it's in Jose. I'm not sure. It says Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. In other words, cut him off. All those things are narcotics. So we know that. They are narcotics, yes. How many other things can we see that could be classed as idols? And how many times are we guilty of holding on to an idol rather than holding on to Christ? There can be many things. It actually could be anything. Agreed. Very much agreed. Numbers. If the church had been in the place where God would have them, they would have had discernment, strength, and wisdom to have understood the character of that class and would have risen above, above the oppression brought upon them by the rebellious and long ago separated from their fellowship, Solomon Cottrell and the whole family, who were an annoyance and hindrance to those who would be right. The meetings were led by Solomon, whose heart was not right with God. With his lips, he professed much to love God, but his heart was corrupt. He was self-righteous and pharisaical, notional, and without order, and would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. I saw that God could not prosper meetings and grace those meetings with his presence with such a leader. For many years, we have had a leader very much like Moses in Elder Jeff. We've had those that opposed what he was trying to say and that which he was attempting to do as he was led to do them. At this point, we seek unity. We seek that which is very elusive in many regards. If our hearts are knit with one another, If we are willing to be shown that which we need to release in our own lives, 
will we not find unity? Amen. Brother Roswell Cottrell's experience and influence in this work, his easy way of leaving everything with the Lord, has hurt the church at Mill Grove. His views were erroneous upon this point. It is not pleasing to God to have men leave with him that which he hath left with them. If Brother Cottrell had cheerfully taken that labor upon him, which he ought, which he should have, and not shirked himself out of care and labor under the plea of trusting in the Lord, it would have been more pleasing to God. It would have saved his wife and daughter much weariness, care, and labor had he taken his share of the burden and sought his ease less. God has left burdens for him to bear as a husband and father, which Brother Cottrell has, apparently, in a very consecrated devotional manner, thrown back upon the Lord. But the Lord takes no such burdens which he has laid upon him to bear. The burdens thrown upon the Lord come back upon his wife and daughter. It is not in the order of God for Brother Cottrell to be eased and others be burdened. Brother Cottrell has had strength to labor with his hands a great deal of the time that he has been resting. He has not loved to labor with his hands and for years has not performed enough manual labor for exercise, which his health has required. It now wearies him to labor. There is no evidence that it is not his duty to labor with his hands a part of the time. His muscles need to be taxed to bear their share of burden. Let them remain inactive and they lose their vigor. And by exercising and laboring with the hands, the muscles cannot at once do their full amount of labor. They cry out in weariness. But soon, with use and taxing, they will do their part and bear their share of burden every time without inconvenience. To go into hard labor at once, after remaining inactive a long time, will exhaust wonderfully. But by taxing the strength gradually, a little more each day, much labor can be performed without injury, but will benefit the health. Amen to that. Now, when Elder Jeff sought to set up the school, they followed a pattern that Mrs. White had laid out of both study and learning. What was the division between study and labor? But it's basically equal. But if you were to err on one side than the other, which, which side well, should you err? You would do more work than study. Okay. Yet, there were those, especially after Parminder came to the school, that claimed the school was what? Um, well, basically, uh, slave labor. Plantation, uh, wasn't it? I kept yeah. hearing harsh. And, yeah, that was another one, plantation. Yeah. The, the odd thing about that is I got grouped in that class that was uh, criticizing the work, which was unfair. The problem that I had is that when I was there in 2016, yes. our, our labor was productive. But when I was there in 2018, the labor was unproductive. And it should always be productive labor. That is, it should be a benefit to others, not merely done uh, to create work. 
Right. Right. So, so they hadn't really followed that counsel uh, correctly, at least by 2018. So there was some room for criticism, but there were a, a class of people who really weren't interested in work at all, whether it was productive or not. So, so what was it, DBS to them? What's that? What was it, like VBS to them? You know, Vacation Bible School? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that really means. Um, I just know when I was in the self-supporting work in British Columbia, um, we worked an eight-hour day, and everything that we did supported the school. And um, the idea of these schools is that they're self-supporting, that you have proper, you know, that you're doing work that is productive, that is helping to support the school. Uh, but if you're doing work that actually is not needed, has no no value, um, all you do is um, uh, it causes people to become discouraged. Right. People can take pride in work that's productive. You can't take pride in work that's unproductive. But, but but the idea here is that we need to labor. And so, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't have really brought up that 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 example. But labor is important. Paul, he labored as a tent maker. Even though he was a minister, he was an apostle. He didn't think that he needed to be studying all the time and just doing church work in order to be a laborer for God. And people who aren't productive um, laborers in, in earthly things cannot be productive labor in spiritual things. Yes, they become idle and tail, tail bearers, and boy, do I ever see it around. Mm-hmm. Each time that I read an admonition such as what Mrs. White is giving mm -hmm. now, I look to apply this first to myself than to anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you work hard. Oh, there's days. <laughs> but, but the problem here, this, I mean, we're looking at this almost in a spiritual sense. Right, even though she's talking about here, these people are lazy, but they're they're not doing the work that God has given them to do. Um, these two guys were actually brothers, uh, Solomon and Raymond. Um, they they had become Adventists. I believe that they were actually uh, some kind of Seventh Day Baptists before they were Adventists. So they so they came to accept Adventism. And they brought with them some of their ideas from their previous religion. So, and, and I've run into these types of people many, many times who, uh, to them, religion is uh, really just a way of escaping responsibility. They like the pretense of religion. It's almost like, well, now that I'm a preacher or something, I don't actually have to work. Uh, I know one uh, pastor, um, uh, uh, he works with uh, Walter Weith, um, just trying to think of his name. Um, but when he was a minister, he actually chose, uh, instead of a church, he chose an, an unworked field with, with his, for his first job where he, he never got any pay. And he chose to work physically um, in order to support himself and, and built up a church and continued always to work uh, physically and, and do work for church members and, and so forth. And, and this was the strongest witness of the gospel in the areas that he worked. Uh, that's uh, Victor Gill is his name. And, uh, you know, it's, but often you have the minister who comes in, 
who's not acquainted with actual work at all. He's become a minister because he doesn't like working and he figures that being a minister is an easy job. That you can get the praise of others while you really do nothing. And they do nothing as ministers. They do very little visitation. Um, and, and really, they're, they're, they're not doing the work of God. And this is, this is really common. It's common not just in Adventism, but everywhere. And they become a burden. And that's, that's why she's used that word, burden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this movement has had those people in it as well. Mm. Now, so what I'm trying to figure out is, is um, did, did they, did she just allude that, um, that they should throw, they should have threw him out? <laughs> that's, Pretty much. That's, that was kind of counter to what we've been talking about, though. <laughs> well, let me. I, yeah, but this this family had earned their way out. They already had their exit fee. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Does this name mean nothing else to you? What name? Cottrell. Yes. Yeah, these are, these are the ancestors of, um, uh, well, Raymond Cottrell and then uh, the other guy. Roswell, wasn't it? Okay, here, here you have Solomon and Roswell that are brothers. Right. Okay. Roswell's great-grandson was Raymond Cottrell. Yeah. Does the name Raymond Cottrell ring any bells with anyone besides Theodore? I've heard the name. Before. I heard Dewey and Dewey talk about it. Raymond Cottrell was a good friend of a man by the name of Desmond Ford. Mm -hmm. Does that mean anything to you? Oh, yeah. It was, it was when those two men, Raymond Cottrell and Desmond Ford, were walking around Washington, D.C. That's where I heard this name. Mm -hmm. That they came to the agreement that there could not be 2,300 prophetic days in Daniel. Here you have generationally one family, Solomon and Roswell, and then going all the way down to Raymond, one family that through misapplication of the testimony and advice given by Ellen White that their family, like leaven, like yeast, had infected an entire church body. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that Raymond Cottrell brought into the Adventist church that has been a very negative influence, a positive hindrance, as Mrs. White would say, upon the church itself. The contention that I will give you for your consideration is that this was done for our admonition today to see just exactly how the word of the Lord, when it is misapplied, can be so detrimental to all of us. Brother Cottrell has been too indolent and has left things in a loose, slack manner. 
In this, his example has injured the Mill Grove Church. The first teachings and example in a church have much, very much, to do with the course pursued by that church afterward. It has been difficult to bring up a certain class in Mill Grove. They have not let the truth elevate them. Brother Cottrell has been very indolent and careless in regards to temporal things. In his business, he has been slothful. Great-grandfather, grandfather, father, grandson, great-grandson, five generations. These generations began with the great-grandfather hearing the admonition given by William Miller that Daniel was referencing 2,300 prophetic days. And by the time it got to the great-grandson, his decision was that the 2,300 prophetic days were literal and not figurative. This is what happens when one is too indolent, when things are left in a loose, slack manner. Mm -hmm. A man who does not love manual labor and is naturally easy and indolent will never make a successful preacher. Mm -hmm. He will ever lack self-denial. He will lack perseverance. He will lack energy. He will never make a thorough workman in spiritual things. There will ever be seen the love of ease and the dislike of exertion in matters of the church, and there will be no disposition to tax the mental facilities. Faculties. Faculties, excuse me. If we are not willing to wrestle with concepts and ideas regarding that which is presented by the wonderful number. If our disposition is not to work through these things, as has been presented by Christ, how will we ever give a message to the world that this world is about to end its existence. If we are given to taking things easy, how will we ever strive to the finish? How will we ever be able to run the race that is before us? Well, you got to train. That's what it's all about, training. Okay. So you can, so you can be ready for the race. Yeah, uh, just an example of this. So, you know, uh, I had an easy time in school. So they, they, they did me a disservice as a child in that uh, – they decided that they weren't going to actually give me any, any sort of direction. They just let me do whatever I wanted because I always got really high marks. And so uh, they thought, well, you know, he's doing fine. But I wasn't challenged. So I basically just daydreamed and wasted my childhood uh, in school. Never really, uh, I mean, I didn't know how to study. I didn't know how to, to be a s successful student. Um, you know, I dropped out of uh, high school, um, and uh, when I became an Adventist, I began to learn how to study. But it it was because you know I was interested in the truth, of course. But it's not like I could study right away. It you have to practice. 
uh, to tax the mind, it, it's like any kind of muscle. And, and most of us have a very uh, short uh, ability to study. That is, we can't concentrate on something very difficult. I agree. Um, and that's one of my, my complaints about others. And, you know, I, I don't mean to complain about others, but when it came to understanding uh, the chronology, um, I basically had worked and labored in the most difficult the most difficult thing I have ever done was to work through the chronology of the Bible. It took hours and hours of concentrated thought. Sometimes it would take two or three weeks to deal with one little point. And, and that was, you know, eight, ten hours a day of reading and studying and trying to understand things, getting all the background information I could. So then I end up laying out this chronology for others I've done a lot of the work, but people won't take the time to actually study it. I mean, there are some that do, but many will just say it's too difficult. And this sort of indolence in spiritual things, I believe, relates a lot to our culture and our society today. We live in a time of luxury and ease. Yes. And people do not know how to tax their energies. True. Especially the intellectual ones, the intellectual strengths. Our minds cannot concentrate. We have to do, you know, preachers do these three-point sermons. Um, they're quite short. Um, they're entertaining. And that's about all the Bible that some people get. Now, of course, you know, we have a Sabbath school lesson. But it's not very deep. Many don't even study it. So, you know, where are we in when it comes to the type of work that we're willing to put into understanding the truth? You know, when I think about, like, writers like uh, Alfred Edersheim, um, he wrote, you know, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, he wrote a book on uh, the temple ministry and its services in the time of Christ. He wrote, uh, I think, six volumes on the Old Testament. And these people had to write by hand. In day, I mean, they could use daylight, and at night they just had a lamp. Um, and they would produce works that I think there are very few people today who could ever do that type of research and write those types of books even with the technology that we have today. Computers. Well, there's not many, that's for sure. Yeah, there's not many who can labor like that. Look at Ellen White, how much she wrote. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the amount of work and labor that has been done by those that have gone before has given us um, a sense of spiritual wealth and physical wealth. And yet we just basically... Um, can't think of the word, but we just waste it, right? We don't we don't appreciate the price that was paid by those in the past. Yeah, the first generation they do their thing and they they write it all out. And second generation totally ignores it. Uh, the third generation never even heard about it. Um, and the fourth generation, they're like, what are you even talking about? But, but we don't even have the skills and the ability to, to appreciate what was done in the past. That True. Is, uh, I mean, the thing that I find so amazing for me personally, when it came to reading the works of the Millerites, um, they're not easy stuff to read. No. It's not light, fluffy, devotional material. No. It takes a great deal of effort to to read that material and sort through it. Yes. And and you know, and I still don't understand everything and I haven't read everything that the Millerites have published. But one thing that I that I know is that 
most of us have no idea um, about what the Millerites believed, how they studied the Bible, how they came to their conclusions. And yet, as Adventists, we can criticize them for being wrong about the second coming of Christ, for being uneducated farmers or whatever we want to call them. But they had a much deeper understanding of the scriptures than people today. Well, the observation of that, that fact is what caused me to become more curious as to the found, actual foundations. Because I would read something in the spirit of prophecy, uh, and it just wasn't jiving with what you know, the general consensus of what it meant was. And there was a reason for that. And, and it was a lack of knowledge as to um, the experience that they uh, fulfilled in history. And, and, and people are just less than willing to spend their time. Look, bro, I got to go cook dinner, okay? Um, hey, uh, I need to go take the dog out to the vet. Or, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I've got more things that I need to do than than actually study. <laughs> yeah. I've heard excuses from people, you know, they, they have a full-time job. Which is I like, got a full-time job. Which is like 32 hours a week or something like that. And so they can't, they don't have the time for study. I mean, I used to work on average uh, 75 hours a week. Hmm. Um, and before that, 100 hours a week, which was way too much. Yes. But... Um, been there, done that. And because then when you're working that many hours, you're not actually as productive. No, you're not. No, so you, you, you actually need to rest, and, and I wasn't resting. So, I mean, you can overdo it on work. But the thing is, um, you know, I still studied. Mm. Um, you know, I studied when I drove. When I was driving, I was always studying. That's the way I listen to most of these um, documentaries that you have. Yeah. So, I mean, there are ways to do it, but we, we're we not efficient in our use of time. We have lazy minds. We do as little as we can. We want to be entertained in the presentations of, that we do see. Yeah. And, and so we're not really spiritually mature. And yet we, we reject things we don't understand that we've never taken the time to study. Um, we're in bad shape. And, and that's all of us. I mean, we are indolent if we are to compare ourselves to those of the past who sacrificed all and put all of their energies and their resources in the development and understanding of truth and in sharing the gospel. Mm. We're all indolent. We all are um, – products of our culture mm -hmm. that that will take so much time for ease and very little time for labor. We've never really stretched ourselves and pushed ourselves. So you need, we, you're saying we need a cultural change. Well, yeah, in a spiritual sense. Yeah. But we have to look at things differently. We have to learn what self-sacrifice is, you know, um, you keep I, saying these things, and I just keep hearing um, uh, Six Sigma uh, uh, philosophy. Yeah, I, I don't know what that is. but Sigma is just manufacturing, the higher end of manufacturing um, yeah. thinking. Yeah, so I remember when I, when I moved to Warburg back in 1988, uh, the guy who had invited us there, Elmer Knopp, um, he – he helped us, us young people, right? So he provided us a place to live. And then uh, later he actually bought some land and he paid to build a house for us, and uh, which we were eventually going to buy from him for the cost of that house. Now, when he had got married and lived on the land, he lived in a little shack. And in fact, he still lived in a shack. So he built a much nicer house for us than the house he himself lived in. 
And I felt so bad in, in here is this person who was trying to save us from all of the hardship that he had. And, and I don't think it was actually a benefit in the long run to my family in him doing this. Um, Not making I mean, you work for it as opposed to yeah. just giving it to you? Yeah, I mean, I appreciated it. Not not everyone else did appreciate what he was doing to help others. Mm-hmm. And and you know, uh, you know, he died uh, this year when he was uh, ninety eight, um, and a very spiritual man, very solid Adventist. But he was willing to get to work uh, for others and t- and to labor. Um, and and not to see other people to have to go what he went through. But the reality is we need to go through what he went through. Yes. And it's and the I, experience. And sometimes people don't understand that. They don't realize that by helping other people, you actually are hindering them. Yep. I've seen that produced in my my niece's life, you know, how She was spoon fed everything and then she spoon fed her kids. And then when it got down to the grandkids, oh, my God, what terrors they were, you know, being having everything, you know, and and all they had to do is just act a certain way and they would get it. (laughs) That's what happens with people, though. You know, I mean, if they're not um, made to uh, experience for themselves uh, the ups and downs, um, in life basically it's that walk that we're walking right yeah okay dwight you want to close this up here we're a little bit past our time yeah we are okay we will be returning to this again this next week but the premise here is this testimony is showing us that which is going on within the movement and that which we need to avoid within the movement at this time. Do we have any other comments or questions? Any other thoughts from what we've read today? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, help us, Father, that we may more clearly apply the lessons that others chose not to learn, the lessons that you have presented before us, so that we may learn of you, that we may be strengthened in you, and may come to a clearer understanding of the work that is yet before us. I thank you for the comments of each one today. I thank you for the participation, for the opportunity that we've had to join together. May your will be done. May this be a Sabbath in which we are able to worship you both in spirit and in truth. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.